Kana to hawi ni ngia so guess kle wage ni waki to loda onya to aga ni e that is how creator knows me and that is who i am to to my people my english name is jennifer dockstater and i am the president of the ontario federation of indigenous friendship centers and very pleased to be speaking with you today Hi everyone, my name is Jody Lynn and I work at the Fort Erie Native Friendship Center and I'm very happy to be here as well. Could you we just commit to them indigenous cause and to go um gizi and dodam and my English name is Wendy Cable and I work for the United Native Friendship Center in Fort Francis, Ontario. Miigwech. Hello, everyone. My name is Greg Carell. I am the Education Policy Analyst for the Ontario Federation of Indigenous Friendship Centers. It's great to be here, and we're really excited to have a conversation with everyone. So the Ontario Federation of Indigenous Friendship Centers actually is made up of 29 member friendship centers, and we service the urban Indigenous communities across Ontario in multiple locations. We are hubs of services, including education, for urban Indigenous people. And really, we service people from conception through end of life and everything in between. We are the home away from home, shall we say, for our community members so that they feel safe, cared for, can, can gain education, can gain employment, social supports and cultural supports unique to the communities that, that we live in. So this is such an interesting question. And, and just to give you context, I actually uh, did a little bit of an interview yesterday in preparation for this talk today. And, and I spoke with my nibbling. My nibbling is 12 years old, identifies as they, them. And I asked them what they liked about school. And what they didn't like about school. And I asked them what they actually wanted to learn at school. And, and so that's the context with which I'm going to answer this question. They are an incredibly intelligent 12 year old who does all of their homework while the, while the teacher is lecturing so that they don't have to take it home uh, with them. They typically uh, like to stare out the window. They prefer doing rather than being lectured to. They wish that the teacher wouldn't talk in monotone um, so that there was variation in voice. And they wished that uh, they actually could do some of the things that interested them and not have it repeated over and over and over again what it is that they were supposed to learn because they got it the first time. And they said that some of the things they talked about comfy chairs, they talked about perhaps beanbag chairs in a classroom, as well as regular chairs and bigger windows and windows that opened and maybe trees in the schoolyard uh, where there could be some shade. And maybe they could choose where they, where they wanted to sit instead of being told where they wanted to sit. I found it fascinating that that they shared all that with me and I and because clearly they're very bright and clearly they're very bored and and we all know that that teachers do their very best to meet the needs of the students in the classroom. It occurred to me that that uh, children need uh, smaller class sizes so that we can attend to their needs. Through some of my questioning, I identified uh, this nibbling as as a kinesthetic learner with some some learning strengths in in both auditory and visual learning, but mostly kinesthetic. Um, and and then we went on and I then started talking to my nibbling about a medicine walk that I was getting that I'm going to be taking our community here on with elders. And they got very excited and they became very animated. They listened differently. And I asked them if they wanted to come, 
if it was okay with their parents. And they said, absolutely. And they asked their parents right away. Their parents' response was equally interesting. Their parents' response were, because they had not heard my conversation with my nibbling. And they said, um, well, only if you want to. And I thought, oh, how respectful. So even the parents have a, have a respectful relationship with, with their child, which I think is excellent. And so they, my nibbling said, yes, they very much wanted to. And I, and I said to them, that's great. I will let you know, but can you do me a favor? Can I give you a job? And they said, well, what's the job? And I said, well, as I start to teach about the medicines, as me and the other elders on the medicine walk uh, talk about, about these things and show you these things, would you be willing to take pictures and maybe write what these medicines are so that other people will know what it is that we're talking about? And they got very excited and they started talking about, yes, they would love to do that. And they would also have to charge their cell phone before we went on the medicine walk so that they would have plenty of battery power to be able to, to meet the needs of, of this job that they were given. What I'm pointing out is this is a future scientist of ours. I've already identified with this particular nibbling that, that they actually have the ability, and they've had this since, since they were very young, to observe, to record, and retain information, and translate that information, transmit that, other, that information to other people. And really, their name, because we gave them a name, uh, we're longhouse people in my family, and their name means they see trees. So we identified very early with this one that this one was particularly knowledgeable about the earth. And that does, in a lot of ways, their skills are that of a scientist. And so I don't believe that the school has even identified this about this unique individual, this strength individual, or that the school system can actually meet the needs. And I've got to tell you, I've been in community my entire life and teachers in, in education don't often identify the skills and abilities of the children that they're charged with teaching because they really have not been given the tools to have the class sizes small enough to actually meet that. So in my mind, that's a barrier and a disconnect, let alone there's an automatic devaluing of indigenous knowledge. Here is somebody with a little bit of help and a little bit of involvement uh, and, and community support could be one of our future medicine people if we actually taught them about the medicines of the natural world. So that is a lack in education and I think the world suffers for that. So that's my answer and I'm sticking to it. You can edit that out. So I'll pick up a bit on, on some of the themes I think that, that Jen is speaking to in, in this disconnection. And I think one of the greatest disconnections that our, our communities face and our friendship centers face is, is a pretty significant disconnection between the public school system on the one hand and indigenous systems on the other hand. And I think historically, speaking, a lot of Indigenous systems have faced uh, immense, immense uh, pressure, uh, a lot of immense uh, anti-colonial or colonial violence um, that's resulted in the sort of erasure and sort of like an, an invisible, that have sort of made our systems invisible. And, and, and over time, I think policy to this day, we still, we're, we're still seeing policies, um, you know, that, that perpetuate these massive disconnections because we're still unable in policy to really understand, recognize the tremendous value of, of our community infrastructure and, and indigenous knowledge systems that have, that have been here for, for millennia. And one of the things that we really, really need to be cautious about is 
is I think conceptually thinking, thinking about the school system's responsibility as teaching really about indigenous knowledge, really about indigenous people, really you know, about uh, indigenous concepts, but, but seeding that responsibility to teach through indigenous knowledges to indigenous communities. Because there is a there's tremendous infrastructure in communities. There's the friendship centers um, have been gradually over over many decades building up uh, a pretty significant education infrastructure from languages um, to ceremonial knowledge to to you know culture camps um, to delivering what's called the alternative secondary school program. And over many years, we've we've developed a really significant infrastructure to to be able to develop to be, to deliver opportunities for for our community members and, and students and youth to, to learn through indigenous knowledges. And what we want to see, you know, going forward is really a strengthening of connection between these two knowledge systems. Not not a system um, that's continually sort of asserting more responsibility and, and sort of widening its own parameters and taking in more more and more knowledges um, but really uh, really a, a reimagining of a relationship and a reconciling between systems um, of, of education that is that are that is in, just paramount to moving forward I think in a good way towards uh, towards reconciliation so I think we need to start understanding a bit of truth and truth telling. And I think that starts with really a, 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 a really retelling of, of the stories that, that we have on this land. And that's, and, and that's about the way indigenous knowledge operates, um, the caretakers of indigenous knowledge and, and, where those, and where those communities are located and where that responsibility resides. Um, and, and I think thinking through a dynamic public education system is really thinking through how these systems work together and how we can better um, set up these systems to, to function uh, in, a, in a better way moving forward. I had the opportunity to meet with youth last week, um, youth who are running, helping to run the culture camp at the Fort Erie Native Friendship Center. And I brought this question to the youth. Um, and they were telling me about their hopes and dreams for education. And really what they emphasized over and over again was wanting to spend time learning their own cultural values, wanting to spend time with family, wanting to learn and be able to take that learning back to their homes, and also wanting to be able to teach other younger children what it is that they're learning. Um, so I kind of, I just want to uh, circle back to a little bit uh, about what Jen, what Jen and Greg and Jody Lynn um, have already said that it, it's, it's the act of listening to our youth, listening to our community, and in, in a space or in a sense of uh, looking at liberatory education and connecting that to what I'm hearing from our community and our youth, and it, it's becoming very clear that they're, they're finding their voices in the sense of wanting to make sure that they're, they're given the safety and the experiences in order to engage in knowing who they are um, and how they learn best. And then that allows them the sense of being prepared to learn their way in whatever environment that may be. And, and what I've heard and what, what I've already, or my colleagues have already stated is that sometimes doesn't, it, it's not necessarily the environment of four walls or, or, or a building it can involve our family members. It should involve our elders, our knowledge keepers. It should involve not just one teacher in a classroom of 30 or 40 students. So what that could look like instead is what Jen had very eloquently um, shared with us is that it can happen in a way that 
there are many teachers involved in encouraging young people or, or people at any age or, you know, stage of development to know, to know or try to understand what their needs are and, and their gifts are, and then to be given the opportunities to grow those gifts, not necessarily in the sense of subjects in a school year, not necessarily in the sense of September to June and and leaving out an immensely important portion of connecting to the natural world in the way of summertime, being being able to have the chance to learn experientially in different seasons all year round. And I did hear, I did specifically hear from youth that especially when it's very cold outside, they didn't understand why they, they needed to be inside. It, it's funny because as an adult, I'm thinking, oh, I, I don't really want to be outside when it's minus 40. But the kids were saying, why aren't we able to go outside and skate? Why aren't we able to go outside? That so many things came circling back to, I learn better when I'm outside. I, I have more um, chances to succeed or I, I learn in so many different ways, like Jen mentioned, kinesthetic or auditory, or I think, you know, we think of music as something that we might play or listen to um, in a manufactured way. But some of the kids talked about just listening to the, you know, the, the type of music that nature plays for us all the time. So I, I, I feel that liberatory education is, is how humans best learn. And from my, my community and the youth, they're, they're telling us that inside of four, four walls in a classroom, it is not enough. It, it, it's not, it, it hasn't, you know, it hasn't been negative in the people that I've talked to. They haven't been giving me, they've been giving me lots of uh, challenges to look forward to, not necessarily dwelling on, on anything negative, but they're saying it's not enough. Classrooms are not enough. Subjects are not enough. Um, they need to know more and, and they need to know um, who they are and how they best fit into their learning before um, they're sat in a chair in a classroom. I've been really thinking a lot about this question of liberatory education and I'm wondering um, about the tensions that are existing within the public school system and how can we, like how can the public school system provide a liberatory experience for Indigenous youth? Um, and what, what we're hearing is that the youth want to learn about their culture. They want to learn their histories. They want to be with family and they want to be with community. And so I'm thinking about how difficult it is for the public school system to be able to offer this kind of education when teachers are specifically taught, importantly taught to stay out of the culture. And yet this is what a lot of our youth are, are craving and are hungry for and are ready for. Um, and so I think this speaks to the need for partnership. Can we really have um, liberatory education for Indigenous youth in the public school system? I'm not so sure. I, I, I would say probably not. I think about um, even drawing par comparisons to, if we're in a patriarchal system, do we throw in a little bit of feminism and think that patriarchy is no longer the foundation? I think it's the same thing when we look at the public school system, when we see that the foundation is, is rooted in, in whiteness and in uh, this Eurocentric, curriculum and, and way of being and way, ways of thinking about how we learn and what we learn and what it means to, to be a person on Mother Earth and, and on this planet. How, what kinds of values do we want to teach our children? So I think this speaks to um, the need for us to talk about these multiple, as Greg said, these multiple systems of education that exist and the, the necessity of the public school system working with friendship center education models that are being um, enhanced and continue to grow and develop. Yeah, 
And I would just add to that that one of the biggest things that I that I can see that that the current model of uh, education system employees, whether that be public or Catholic schools, is is the need to control and and the need to and and the tendency to put regulation above above common sense or or the actual needs of the students or the families uh, that that uh, there's not relationships that are built with people, they're relationships currently, and it's typical in, in colonial systems, that the colonial system will put in structures that make it harder for, for humans to relate, whether that be teacher to student, student to, to teacher, or, or most importantly, the family to the teacher, and, and that the child might actually be more expert than, than we actually give them credit for. Uh, you know, there, there tends to be a top-down hierarchy in education that inhibits liberatory education and, and the goal to achieve that. So the Ontario Federation of Indigenous Friendship Centers has been funded through the Ontario Trillium Foundation, a six-year grant to really to really better understand uh, the friendship centers as a site of learning. And this is uh, a six year grant to really look at the systems and do systems change work because that's that's the work that our communities tell us is required. And I think exactly what my colleagues have, have spoken to is this idea of, I think this, this sort of boundedness that the public system imposes and it, it bounds our students in a relationship uh, that's hierarchical, it bounds our students in a relationship between four walls it bounds our students in, in, in various policies that really uh, reinforce a structure that is not theirs and they don't feel that they're reflected within. And so we really want to re-examine this, this infrastructure and really um, the, this fund has really helped our, our communities. Um, it's funded three communities to really dig deep into a, a process that we call after Willie Ermine, a uh, Cree scholar from out West, memory work because it's really important that our communities have the time and space, especially friendship centers who are, you know, have this tremendous infrastructure, but are really very, very busy and very overwhelmed with community need versus, I think, um, uh, a sort of dearth of, of resources, resources and, and infrastructure that, um, that doesn't always match the community need that, uh, that our centers have, have faced. And so we needed this, this fund and we needed this time and space to really come together and bring our communities together in these three, three communities to think through these questions, um, to think about where we've come from, uh, what type of structures that, that uh, have, have led our communities to survive all these years and, and really understand what we wanna bring forward into, into the present and into the future so we can better make visible and I think that's really where this project is going is to restory uh, an infrastructure so that the world can see it so that the, our province, you know, our provincial partners and our and our school board partners can really begin to understand the nuances of indigenous knowledge and, and the nuances of, of who's responsible for, for this knowledge. And, and this, this has really helped us sort of think about how to better coordinate our own resources and think through and, and remap really where uh, where these relationships happen, because as we said, the relationships are bounded in the public system where, where we really want to build an unbounded system for Indigenous students. So that, that means creating really strong pathways um, between the systems so students, students can move, so, that, so, so students can flow, and, and, and then we can rethink um, the spaces of where knowledge exists, because the, really knowledge is a relationship between people. It's a relationship between people and, and space. It's a relationship between people and place, ancestors and, and future ancestors. Um, so we really need to think through um, this model of unboundedness. And, and one thing we really have to understand, and, and school boards really need to understand, I think, is that positive self-identification happens differently from individual to individual, from community to community. And we need to meet people and communities where they are. And I think um, part of that is to create um, even even the possibilities for to to get in you know to get into community to take one to go to one activity to go to one class, and then and then build up and think about how do how can we offer 
uh, more robust programs, full, full systems and community, and, and maybe a full education through indigenous knowledge, through indigenous languages and community. Um, it's a long-term project and, and, and friendship centers themselves are on very different you know, trajectories and different capacities across our movement. But we know um, that in every friendship center, there exists tremendous and almost infinite potentials to create uh, new learning possibilities for indigenous students that um, that have not been captured by Indigenous policy. And in, in many ways, Indigenous policy, um, it doesn't recognize an Indigenous elsewhere. It's always trying to bring um, and try to be everything and everything for, for, for everyone. Um, and, and we want um, really to, to move with our partners towards a, a, more, um, a more robust, real uh, partnership that, that has an equilibrium. Um, and, and that we can sort of envision um, together uh, also how to move these systems forward uh, collectively. If you don't mind, I'd actually like to start this one. I think that we have to recognize that, that uh, truth and reconciliation and the calls to action, that, that this work is very much centered in, in schools and practical changes is, and we've said it again and again, it's outside of the four walls and and you have to recognize that in indigenous communities the actual act of those four walls is a traumatizing experience uh, for our people because in those four walls in previous generations that has been the home of cultural genocide uh, actual genocide abuse and pain for our people and and how that translates to our children is that now our children and, and grandchildren are, are attending these schools and are they any different? The smallest of, the, of things can trigger and can trigger us. And, and it includes the, the things that, that the non-Indigenous community will see as necessary for safety and the rules and the regulations that, that, that prevent harm uh, to, to individuals, yes, but more protect from liability, actually put up functional barriers to engaging with, with parents, grandparents, aunties and uncles on the care of the child who is inside those four walls behind a locked door, supposedly for their safety, something that our community couldn't trust in the past historically. And in all reality, given that the amount of racism that and, and the overpopulation of, of uh, student to teacher ratios, the racism that's happening in those, in those schools, either by teachers or by other students toward communities of color. Um, I'm not sure that, that, uh, that the liability is actually addressed through locked doors and, and keeping families out or only allowing them to be there at certain times. So when you put it in that historical context, uh, what practical changes need, need, to, be, uh, need to be brought, uh, open the doors, uh, let our students out and, and let our families in and, and have it be more of a relationship where we are all responsible at all times for educating children. Uh, and they are responsible to us to, ed to educate us. And if we, can't re if we can't create that reciprocal relationship between our children and our families and our teachers, all in harmony with one another, then what are we really doing? We're perpetuating continued, continued colonial systems, and we're not operating within an anti-racist uh, framework, which is essential moving forward. So I, th I think listening is, is probably one of the foundational skills that that school boards really need to to pick up and and we need to we need to start listening to where communities want to go and it's it's really important to think about the type of the type of responsiveness in 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 school systems um, they have to like, we want responsive systems. We don't want indigenized systems. It's, it's not, it's not really a responsibility of school boards to deepen and, and to, um, to pull in indigenous knowledges, but, but to really create robust partnerships. And you can only create really strong partnerships by listening and, and, and 
indigenous communities have a tremendous um, creativity and innovation and, and really just a burgeoning infrastructure that, that most education policy has not, not caught up to. And so I think it's really important to understand where communities are today um, and to listen, most importantly, to where communities want to go. And, and it's those goals, those priorities that we really need school boards to just attune to um, and, and to just support and listen by, by first listening um, we create a, a foundation for a stronger relationship, um, but then, but then it also opens us up to to our responsibility, which I think is to really think about how how these systems are resourced. Because as strong and as as a burgeoning infrastructure, friendship centers still lack uh, for a tremendous uh, amount of resources. When you compare um, what goes into communities versus the $25 billion machine of, of, of public education, um, it's almost impossible for us to, to work within these parameters. So what really needs, we need to happen is, is, is first listening to the stories that, that are beginning to emerge when we have the space and time to think critically about our, our, our landscapes, to re, when we're remapping and restoring the, the, the education structures in our communities, we really need um, strong partners to, to listen to where those stories are going to take us and, and to, to really think critically about what resources are needed to get uh, our, our communities and our infrastructure to a place that's going to create, I think, a tremendously dynamic education system, um, you know, for, for all community members, for all, for all Canadians, really, all Ontarians. Um, when Indigenous students can walk more seamlessly and unbounded between um, between systems and through uh, Turtle Island um, to really to really foster their their own education journeys and, and wherever that takes them in their relationships, um, I think that's that's the most practical I think thing we can tell tell our boards is is to really just start listening. I think it's a tricky time for educators as they're looking educators in the public school system as they're looking to figure out how to. Um, work with Indigenous content and for the Indigenous studies classes, um, how to work with this material. So I, I'm also a certified uh, teacher in Ontario, and I just finished taking an AQ, the FNMI studies AQ. And I thought it was really interesting. Teachers were asked to uh, read an article about using the medicine wheel in teaching, and then to think about how to incorporate that into their own practice. And so, we have mainstream educators who have read a two page article now thinking about how to use this, um, the, the wheel in their classroom. Um, and it raises the question, is this, is this an appropriate way of working with the material? People are thinking about, well, how, how, do, I, how do I engage with indigenous curriculum and content? And what is indigenous education really looking like in the public school system? Um, but maybe trying to take that circle and placing it onto the square of the public school system, maybe that causes harm. Maybe that's, maybe that's not a safe thing for teachers to be doing. Um, if people don't have lived experience, if they don't have their own teachings um, and have simply read an article, is, is that appropriate? Um, so how we take up Indigenous education between the public school system and at the Friendship Centre, they're, they're, they're quite different ways of doing or thinking about what Indigenous education really is and, and how it could unfold. I completely, I thank you for, for talking about that, Jody Lynn, because it just reinforces what my, the people that my research, the, the community members had, had talked so much about relationships first. So talking about honoring so we've talked about honoring our, our history and, and honoring where we are now, but a practical change needed for the future really of our, of our, of our global society and, and our education is honoring relationships. Are, are we honoring the, the efforts of those that have the teachings to give if if we you know in 
without ill intention, if, if we give an activity to a, a group of, you know, certified teachers, and I myself am, as you are, Jody Lynn, a, a certified teacher in Ontario, we would all do, uh, you know, some, we would all, you know, from, from our place, we would try to do our best to be respectful and to, you know, connect our, our medicine wheel activity to the curriculum outcomes and and we would we would do our best and probably you know come up with many ways of imparting that information to students but are we honoring where that information comes from are we bringing in are we approaching our community our local community not you know uh, uh overriding medicine wheel activity are we approaching knowledge keepers in our community and honoring their knowledge by offering them tobacco are we building a relationship with the people that we live beside or or are forgetting to include and honor in those teachings and learning so many things at the same time as building that relationship because the relationship won't only encompass how in a good way we can approach a knowledge keeper or an elder and how we can make sure that it's a safe place for them to come into our schools do our do our schools or our places of learning our areas of learning wherever we are do we have our medicines there available do we have an elder somewhere, it, you know, in our classroom or in our building for our youth to turn to if they need to speak to an elder or a knowledge keeper. One of the first people that I interviewed for this research project, he said, he talked about um, when we first started, when the, we, I wasn't there, but when the Friendship Center first started in Fort Francis, he talked about wanting, he had had so many negative experiences, uh, racially charged experiences within the community, that he, as soon as he heard there was a Friendship Center movement, you know, beginning in Fort Francis, he wanted to be part of it. And he wanted to help people understand different ways of living. And he said the first, one of the first things he did was was, you know, introduce uh, himself and his family to the center. And then he, at that time, this was many, many years ago, he was able to just to, um, you know, take all the children and some of the adults to his ice fishing um, line on the lake in, in the winter. And he said that, that, and he's just like, he is just the most just the most un, like they're so kind him and his him and his uh, wife were talking all about the friendship center and he just said it the kids taught me at the same time as I was teaching them a skill that they had never never even thought they could do they never thought they could fish in the winter time except for one you know one little line in in the fishing hole but this was an experience of setting a net under the ice in the winter time and he just said he loved that experience so much because the learning went on between all ages and and he wanted his true you know part of his truth was that he wanted to help people understand different ways of living and he said the way i grew up was different than the way you know some of my uh, the other people in my community grew up and he just wanted to share and so thinking about that, what practical changes could be needed for an, an experience like this, I always, I, I distinctly hear so many people talking about, we're forgetting to honor our knowledge keepers and our elders, and they're waiting for us. They're waiting for us to, to share their information with us. So it may not be as easy as it used to be, but uh, a practical change is definitely, I think, um, connecting, well, first connecting 
the teachers and 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 the boards to the knowledge carriers in your community and and i come from a small town so i i know at the beginning we talked to uh, or we listened uh to sultan say this you know they're from toronto like a huge city but there are knowledge keepers there 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 are knowledge holders and elders there i i'm i'm sure of it and so connecting those people i think is not an insurmountable task connecting all of that knowledge i think is is a good step in in the right direction i have to mention one other thing and it's kind of going to lead into the last question so i hope that it's okay um and i'm going to take some liberty with that um I think we have to be cognizant that that just because uh, and and I appreciate the use of of uh, the medicine wheel. Um, not every culture in Canada has four directions in a medicine wheel, and so we. So what does this actually speak to? And and. Uh, what I, what I would like educational leaders to know is the diversity in the Indigenous community, that, that just because you heard one Indigenous elder or knowledge keeper speak, they always specify where they're from. Um, and, and I'm Haudenosaunee, and, and we have a three-sided medicine wheel. Um, I understand from, and I was fortunate enough to be taught by Anishinaabe elders, when I speak of, of the medicine wheel, I need to specify whether I'm speaking of those teachings that I gained from an Anishinaabe elder or my own teachings that were taught to me by my family, which is a three-sided medicine wheel. And then there are some Indigenous people that don't even have a medicine wheel. So, so those things, we have to recognize that assimilation tries to make everyone the same. And, and unfortunately, in the Indigenous community, it's bad enough that, that, that there's an assimilation to be the same as other Canadians, which loses Indigenous identity. But further to that, what actually happens is that the colonial system of education unfortunately generalizes Indigenous that and tries to give everybody the same teachings and and that is not actually accurate to the diversity of indigenous nations that that reside within the borders of what is now called canada what is now called canada turtle island is much larger than canada and is certainly much larger it's even larger than canada and the united states it goes all the way down to the tail which is Mexico. So, you know, that diversity is huge. And, and I would really like educators to start to understand that and stop generalizing whatever Indigenous knowledge they have as limited only to what, to what they heard somebody say at one time, that they, they have to go a little bit deeper than that. I mean, I just want to say one tidbit from what Jen, Jen is speaking to, and I think, I think the education system, when it does try to teach about uh, an Indigenous people, it has a tendency um, to take that responsibility, uh, and, and what it looks like is really a flattening of Indigenous knowledge, and it's really not even about teaching Indigenous knowledge, but, but rather sort of a, a knowability of Indigenous peoples that is an extension of colonial logic. And I think what's happening is you you have this pressure, you know, from from provincial policy and from all different directions to to meet TRC demands, and so you have a lot of teachers that really want to do a, a tremendous job and and they want to they want to meet the needs of Indigenous students, and that should be definitely encouraged. But we really have to go back and and think about whose responsibility it is to teach through because it's. It's very dangerous to, to teach. Um, it's very dangerous to flatten indigenous knowledge and, and, and put it into sort of a, a structure that's not indigenous 
and to teach through bureaucracy, to teach through a very specific system with very specific goals. Um, and that sort of boxes Indigenous knowledge into, into a place of no ability. And, and that's inherently dangerous for, for our communities. And, and that's not where, it's not where we want to go. We want to go to a place that really recognizes the dynamic, rich uh, nature of, of our community organizations, of, of the, the creativity and innovation that's been put and the thought that's been put into um, the spaces that, that our communities have created for their communities um, are, incredibly, are incredibly positioned to do uh, much more, uh, take on much more education responsibility than I think has ever been recognized. And it's a failure of Indigenous uh, education policy. It's a failure really of, of imagination um, not to think about the incredible, uh, I think, synergies for lack of a better word, but like how can we work better to, to really promote these incredible rich uh, knowledge landscapes um, in a ways that aren't colonizing, in ways that, that promote self-determination of urban Indigenous people and, and the ways that we've come to organize in our communities. So I think that's, there's tremendous vision today of, of where we can go with, with our movement, uh, with our education infrastructure, and we are gradually building towards it. And I encourage, um, I encourage every educator, every school board leader to really think about how they support our vision and our education priorities, because that's that's what reconciliation is. And that's, that's really what it comes down to is strong um, partnerships that are, that are led by indigenous communities. So, um, you know, we're really incredibly in a, in a rich place and we've come a very long way and, uh, but there's, there's a long way to go in, in between here and where our communities are telling us they wanna go. So uh, we invite everybody along for this journey and we're, we're incredibly excited to, to, to continue the journey towards uh, really robust, strong, self-determined uh, Friendship Center uh, sites of learning. So I agree. I agree with what everyone has said today. And, and I, I, my last thought is that most, almost all of the research I've done so far with every, um, every, every person or family I spoke to said that the Friendship Center is a safe place. So when you speak of what do you want educators and educational leaders to know, and I, I spoke of earlier, is is your space a safe space? Is it welcoming? Is it, is it a safe space? And if you want to know, find the people in a respectful way where they can tell you if it's safe or not. They can show you how to make your space safe. And listening to everyone I interviewed saying that was probably at least one of the first things they said was that the Friendship Center was a, just a place that say, they felt safe to be themselves. And we do that by inviting, we've done that by inviting elders and having ceremonies and learning and listening and taking direction from our local, the people, our community that wants to be part of the Friendship Center. So in, in every way that I can, I encourage people to seek out knowledge keepers and, your, and, and elders in your area in a respectful way so that you can start building those relationships to make your space safe and that may even lead into teachings about the history or their, the history of that area, the, the language of that area, and the, you know, the need that we have as not just as, you know, part of this area, but 
our global society to start building a relationship with our natural world that you know is is going to help our youth take care of not just themselves and their family members but also our natural world so miigwech I guess my my final thought would be um, I'm I'm I have my mind's eye um, a conversation we had a few weeks ago with youth and they were just wanting to know why 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 is that dance done that way why is this dress happening this way tell me more about why the ceremony is like that and question kept um, the youth kept saying why they want to know why and to me that really just demonstrate that they already know the value of indigenous knowledges they don't they don't need to be convinced they don't need to um they don't have any sense that uh the knowledges are simplistic they know how valuable and how important the knowledges are and they're just so hungry for it and that's one thing that i i really take away from my conversations with the youth they're so excited and so motivated and so engaged to learn about themselves and the relationship with themselves and with each other and how to have cross-cultural relationships and cross-cultural communication, how to um, support them, themselves and their well-being and community well-being, and just how to be stronger members of the community. Um, so those are the thoughts that I'm left with when I think about uh, Indigenous education opportunities. Hi, everyone. I'm Rita Russo, the director at Kawartha Pine Ridge District School Board. And I'm joining you today from my office, which is situated on the treaty and traditional territory of the Michisagi Anishinaabeg. And thank you for including me in this, in this conversation. So from my perspective, what does liberatory education look like and feel like? And I appreciate the question because let's, let's take it from the perspective of the term itself for me, liberatory education, is not one that's been socialized um, that we speak to. Uh, so I think it's important that we make meaning of this word. Um, for me, it looks like centering students, uh, centering their identity, their lived experience, their story. Um, and it feels like connection. Uh, so when the classroom or the environment, that learning environment um, is filled with um, a circle of support for that particular child or youth. Um, there's a sense of connection and reciprocal relationship that occurs. Um, it's a holistic feeling. Uh, it is one that uh, sees uh, and takes all aspects of that student um, into being. And it elevates um, the agency that they have. Uh, it allows students to be at the center of their own learning and those that are surrounding them with that support uh, in helping them to, to do that learning uh, so that they can be their best selves um, and do their best work in, in that particular learning environment or that community. I want to start by introducing myself, Jiwon Chanik. I'm the director at the Waterloo Region District School Board. Uh, we are situated on lands that have been traditionally stewarded and cared for by the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and Chinatown peoples. Um, and we continue to learn from and benefit from the stewardship of, of Indigenous people um, throughout, the, uh, throughout the region. Um, you know, by way of introducing myself, um, I just want to be able to start also by just briefly um, sharing a little bit about my ancestry, um, which is, you know, uh, black, brown, indigenous, um, and white. And, um, you know, my ancestry, a lot of it was lost to us through colonization. And it was only within the last 10 years that I reconnected with the indigenous part of my ancestry, um, which is actually in the South Pacific. Uh, Polynesian ancestry and um, uh, it's been a long journey of uh, reconnecting with that and um, you know was able to get back there this year and, and sit in ceremony for some time and be able to um, 
um, when my friends were asking me about it, I think, you know, what I said to them is, how do you explain that you were missing something with every part of your body that you didn't even know existed? Um, and I think that, um, you know, that's in part the legacy of colonization. And I'm, you know, mindful um, in acknowledging my ancestry, you know, the ways that I also benefit from settler privilege and um, as well as um, that I don't speak on behalf of um, indigenous people on Turtle Island. But I do recognize the shared experience and, um, and in that context, thinking about liberatory education for me, um, you know, ultimately at the heart of it, it is education that would lead to freedom and to, you know, our children being able to experience uh, their full selves, the richness of who they are, to experience joy, to experience um, the fullness of one another um, without having to constantly navigate the strain and the pressures. Um, that are connected to you know the bodies that they're in and the identities that they have um, for too long in public education we have been able to um, predict outcomes based on the identities of children um, and that has not changed and, and you know the same groups of children continue to be disproportionately affected indigenous, black, racialized, um, queer, identifying those coming out of poverty, those with identified special education needs. Um, and that needs to change. And in particular, um, here on Turtle Island, we have a relationship that's based on treaty relationships. Um, we have truth and reconciliation. We have a re relationship that we are trying to repair because schooling, um, you know, in, in the part of Turtle Island we today call Canada, uh, was premised on the erasure of Indigenous people. Um, and so um, I think, you know, um, you know, as Rita was mentioning, and, and uh, for myself, that a big part of our job is to try and do our best to make sure that um, you know, all students can see themselves and to be able to know that they matter and that when and that from where we sit, recognizing that schooling was set up for Indigenous children to be unsuccessful and that we have a responsibility to um, try and, and to make sure that we address those structures, but to do so um, in a way that is systemic, in a way that acknowledges the community as partners, in a way that doesn't create an us versus them, but an us in partnership and in, in relationship with one another um, so that we can do this. Because I, you know, from my own self as a director, I know I can't do this by myself. Um, you know, and even if staff try to do it on their own without community uh, support, and their expertise and their brilliance, uh, we wouldn't be able to do it. So I think, um, you know, uh, liberatory education for me uh, requires us to come together. And I think it was um, Jody Lynn who was talking about um, a bit about the reciprocal relationships and what does that look like, um, not only from the place of relationship, but also from the place of, um, of learning. Yeah, so, I, you know, there were a few different uh, points in the video, and I, I mean, I think for me, um, these are things that we know, that, that we all know, and we share that collective responsibility in this day and in this age to be able to know we need to do better. Um, I often say we can't express sadness at the children who are still being recovered and returned home where former residential schools are. Um, um, and not at simultaneously ask ourselves what is our responsibility to think and to be and to do things differently. Um, you know, um, Wendy talked a lot about, you know, the need to listen to youth. And I think that for me from where, where I'm sitting, one of the things, I mean, we just completed our student census and, you know, um, just under 3% of, of our students are identifying as Indigenous. Um, 
First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and also much more are 3% um, um, or just under 3% um, represent over 66 nations. And of our first languages, five of our first languages are indigenous languages. And so we have that unique opportunity. And I think this is where, you know, one of the things that I, I believe it was Greg was pointing to is the unique way that urban areas, um, you know, bring together um, indigenous peoples from all over who may not necessarily be connected to their communities. Um, and so, you know, a big part of that for me was, you know, what does it mean to support, um, you know, Indigenous students and families in, in our communities? What does that need to look like? Because it can't just be one way. Um, uh, Wendy was talking about the importance of listening to our youth, and that's something that we've really been trying to look at in a very tangible way, um, including like our organizational structure. We're rejigging our organizational structure. We're just about to make some announcements, but uh, student voice is moving right into the director's office. And we're looking at an accountability mechanism where we would be accountable to students. Um, we're also looking at rejigging the organizational structure um, to be able to reflect that in a better way. Um, we're looking at uh, blurring the lines around um, how we see community engagement is to really emphasize the relationship between us and families and communities so that their brilliance and expertise are seen at the same level as the staff um, and that it truly requires a relationship for us to be able to um, uh, to, to get there and to be able to work through it because, you know, um, and I think this was Greg who was talking about, you know, we can't expect um, education systems to try to indigenize everything. That's not the way it works. Um, in fact, we will be asking people who aren't qualified to do that, to try and do something that they might with the best of intentions cause even more harm, right? And so I think, um, that's where we have to really build those relationships with the with with elders, with wisdom keepers, with those who are in our communities, um, you know, and that we're a part of those communities so that that reciprocal relationship can help us to be able to build towards, um, you know, and this is something that came up in our um, strategic plan, we just completed the process at the end of this last year, an explicit commitment to um, indigenous sovereignty and a pathway towards that. And so I think those are some of the things that we're thinking about that um, and that. And so the comments from um, the video and from, you know, everyone as they were speaking that really resonated as we're trying to do some of this work now. So for me, uh, I have to say, I watched the videos three times. The first time I, I listened with my head and I took down copious notes because I didn't want to miss anything. The second time I listened with my heart um, and took all those tools away because I really wanted to hear the message. And then the third time I tried to put those two pieces together and, and to ask myself as a director, um, what, what do I really need to do to make sure that um, I'm being a responsive leader um, and charged with, with this very, very important work? And so when you ask, were there, was there a particular moment? There were many, and, and Jiwan uh, spoke to some of them that resonated for me, but um, two in particular that stand out was when Greg spoke about bounded structures that exist. And then when Jennifer talked about functional barriers. So when I think about education and our system, um, I mean, let's face it, it is rooted in Eurocentric ideologies. Um, and we have to ask ourselves as leaders, as educators, all of us that are here today, you know, what are some of those bounded structures and what can we do to rethink and reimagine as Greg is really urging us to do. And the poignant thing for me, when Jennifer spoke about change, she talked about, I have practical advice for you. She said, open the doors, 
She said, let our children, our students out and let families in, right? So when we think about how do we do that within those bounded structures that Greg spoke about, I think it's incumbent upon us, I will say incumbent upon me as a leader um, to rethink and reimagine how we do that. And we do have structures in place in Kawartha Pioneer District School Board, and I'm gonna to refer to, to us as KPR, uh, and, and some of the work that we have been doing um, through some of those structures. And one of them is the uh, Indigenous Education Advisory Committee. So um, partners from the three uh, First Nations communities that we serve, as well as the Indigenous Friendship uh, Center uh, sit on this advisory committee. And um, we have candid conversations through the leadership of our Indigenous Education Department saying, you know, not all of our students with Indigenous identity are doing well, so what do we do? Um, and uh, Negojman on Friendship Centre, located in Peterborough, um, they actually said, we can help. We, we, can, we can do things differently if we can find a pathway. So that unbounded pathway uh, is something that we explored um, through a, uh, an agreement. Um, we, we created a memorandum of understanding that is going to allow some of our KPR students to access the Friendship Center during the instructional day so that they can be immersed in Indigenous culture uh, and so that they can be learning from and with, um, you know, Indigenous um, knowledge keepers, elders. Uh, so, so those pieces are things that we, we absolutely can do, but it's going to require uh, a reimagining, a rethinking, um, and um, the ability for each and every one of us to sit in whatever space um, that we have to influence change uh, to do that. I think that is a, a key piece. Um, so if a structure doesn't exist, try to find a pathway to ensure that that structure exists. Um, some of the pieces that Jiwan spoke about, we too are engaged in. One of the things that I think is really pivotal is making it very clear to everyone in the organization what our core values are. So as we launch this school year, we are launching with a new board action plan with a very, very clear action related to how we're going to build and strengthen relationship um, by centering Indigenous voices, by ensuring um, that we are engaging in a true reciprocal relationship so that um, we can rethink the way uh, school systems uh, can actually be places of healing and that we can do that work together. There's a lot of work to be done. Um, and I think that when we come together at conferences like this, and I've been a FASI participant for years, and, and it feels good because we're surrounded by like-minded people who want to make change, who are, who are deeply invested in the why, uh, but we need to walk away with some of those hows. And, a, and I think that a conference like this gives us the opportunity to do that. So I spoke a little bit about, as a director, I want to ensure that everyone understands what our key commitments are uh, to ensuring that Indigenous voice, Indigenous knowledge perspective um, is centered. Uh, so you'll see that very clearly in our KPR action plan. And the accountability pieces are incredibly important in this work. But when I think about what can each and every one of us do, before we get into you know, um, being able to utilize whatever sphere of influence we have, I think a, a, a key piece is to really hold that mirror to ourselves and to really think about um, how do you engage in self-reflection after you've watched uh, that video, after you've watched uh, the truths being spoken about experiences of some of our students. Um, and, and what is it uh, that you need to do to uh, 
uh, engage with that knowledge in a particular way? Who do you need to call upon? At KPR, we do have an Indigenous education um, department that is led by uh, a superintendent, has a principal, um, we have an elder on that panel, and then uh, how we center the voice of, of Alderville First Nation, Caribbean Lake First Nation, and Hiawatha First Nation, and our urban Indigenous um, voices. So I think it's, it's about really asking yourself, what do I need to do uh, to engage in this work in a meaningful, meaningful way that is going to make change. And each and every one of us that are here today, uh, we hold different responsibilities, different titles. So for me, my work is going to be different than your work. Um, but it's a commitment to self first. Um, and it's through uh, a deeper understanding of, you know, what's my role in this relationship that's going to take us to change? And how do I effectively make that change that's going to honor um, the voices of those that I have heard or those that I'm trying to serve? Um, and that's not a one-time thing. It happens over time. Right? Um, and I think that uh, Jiwan touched upon something that is incredibly uh, important, and that is where do students sit, right? Structures matter. So that's what I think you're, you're leaning on, Jiwan, when you say um, we're going to rejig the structures to ensure that student leadership um, or student voice uh, reports to a place that is noted and will be held to account. Um, and we, too, uh, have looked at that with a particular portfolio to student voice. Students have agency. Um, do we give them the, aid, the, the, the space to activate that agency? And um, that starts with self, and uh, that starts with creating um, the vision. And as director, that is an incredibly, incredibly important thing that we do, uh, but it's holding others to account so that we are truly being that, um, that organization or living um, that value statement that we make, not just words. Yeah, thanks uh, so much, Rita. Um, I think maybe I'll pick up from one of the last points that you were making about setting the vision. And as we just uh, um, went through our strategic planning process, um, and I was reflecting, I think it was Wendy who was talking about, you know, the need to really focus on the gifts that children bring, right? And, and that language, particularly of gifts, um, is something we hear often within um, Indigenous communities, the gifts that children bring. Um, you know, and, and I was really happy when, as we went through our strat planning process, our new vision statement that we've come up with actually starts off by saying celebrating the gifts of each and every student by creating limitless opportunities for them to flourish, grow, and become their best selves. Um, and so we now have sort of a, um, a, you know, a guiding star for us to be able to say, this is what we're doing. And, and to recognize um, as part of that, you know, we're building a community and family engagement strategy to really in a very accountable and transparent way, share with the community how we intend to engage with them. And, and this would include, um, um, you know, indigenous um, community members, especially given that as, a, as a, um, an urban board, just how many different communities that we serve and thinking about what that looks like. You know, I can share um, a little bit that one of the schools that we're currently in the process of building is, is being um, uh, designed by an indigenous led um, architecture firm with the goal of trying to be able to um, think about how we bring community in, how we bring learning out, how we think about some of those pieces as well, um, you know, so that we can really um, try to think about doing things differently. Um, and, in, in, and also in ways that are transparent and, and accountable, you know. Um, 
you know, and, and that really requires us to engage in deep and meaningful ways. I'm thinking about Jennifer's example about, you know, um, the medicine wheel and, you know, the lessons of the medicine wheel and that not all medicine wheels have, um, um, have four directions, right? And, um, and so how are we building relationships? Um, you know, what does that look like for some of our communities, um, the, the nations that may be represented within our, our district, where it might just be that singular family that's there, right? Um, and, and, and the supports that they might need, what does that look like? Um, and, and how do we think about that? We're fortunate to have, a, um, you know, like, um, like uh, some of the structures that Rita was sharing, um, you know, in, an indigenous led team, you know, with a superintendent and we have, um, you know, Nicole Robinson who helps us and, and indigenous staff. Um, we um, have our outdoor ed pieces that are connected to it, but we also are able to grow food and tobacco and give back to the community as well. Um, you know, there be able to connect students to the land. Um, we're continuing to explore opportunities to be able to create alternative pathways in particular for indigenous youth where they can, where they can accumulate credits for them through language acquisition, through being on the land, through doing learning with elders. Um, and, and so I do agree with um, um, Greg's uh, comment about, um, you know, the, the uh, bounded structures piece, you know, that a lot of times colonial structures were set up to keep communities out, to help, um, you know, kind of to maintain that colonial structure and status. And to Rita's point of how we, um, how we in our roles as directors begin to think about, so how do we do this differently? Yes, this may be the way it has always been done, but just because we've always done it this way doesn't mean it's the way we need to continue doing it. I mean, in fact, we know if we keep doing what we've always done, we'll keep getting what we've always gotten. Um, and if we are explicitly committed to truth and reconciliation, then we have a responsibility and an obligation to begin to identify where, where the structures themselves are the problems. And so, um, and who better to tell us than the community? Who better to tell us than the parents and the grandparents and, and the elders, you know? Um, I think like that's one of the things um, that I reflect on, you know, um, um, and, and think about, you know, the responsibilities that the grandmothers um, and elders uh, gave me, um, you know, so eight years ago at Turtle Lodge um, in ceremony and the work that I, they said, this is your work in education. Because um, some days it gets hard and then I remember, um, yeah, I don't have much choice because this is the responsibility that I've been given. Um, but, you know, they're the ones who uh, can actually shine the light on, on the cracks. They can shine the light on where the walls are, and, and then that allows us to be able, if we listen from a place of heart and not just head and not just with the, you know, being defensive, that we can really build those relationships because sometimes we will mess up. I know sometimes I will mess up. Um, I know sometimes the structures are built a particular way and I feel like I have no other choice. And, I, and then when we do have those uh, relationships in place, then the community also knows. And then there's a way that we can navigate going forward to find something a different way, a new way, a better way that will ultimately help students to be successful. So when I saw this question, I, I can't help but uh, think about principles within our, you know, our own KPR structure. And at KPR, prior to my arrival, um, we made um, it very clear that we had seven principles that we were going to engage with um, Indigenous education. And I'm just going to highlight two of them because I think that there are two that really stand out um, to be foundational to the work. Because um, while these principles are posted in every school, uh, those posters went up and the knowledge building or knowledge creation and understanding kind of took a pause um, once you know the last couple of years happened 
Um, but one of those principles is uh, the principle that many of you have heard, and that is nothing about us without us. And what we are working really hard to do is to make sure that it's not just the catchy phrase, but it is a way of being here at KPM. And so no matter where we are, um, we are asking ourselves, have we consulted? Right? Uh, if it's um, a senior team discussion table, um, we hold each other to account around whether or not um, Indigenous community was, or Indigenous voice was sought, be it through students or, you know, the formal structures that we had. And to Jiwan's point, we mess up sometimes, right? We, it, it, it is not a, a true uh, way of being yet, um, but that is what we are working towards, that our culture is really reflective here at KPR, uh, that we will not, um, uh, you know, engage in um, decisions or direction uh, that are going to impact our learners in a particular way without having um, consulted. Uh, so we're seeing that. We're seeing that um, in different spaces. I have seen it at a trustee table, and I want to celebrate that because, um, you know, we brought something to board one evening, and that was the question from one of the trustees. So when it's the governing body and folks that are in, you know, in classrooms closest to the student desk, ensuring that those voices are, um, are accessed to make sure that we are serving, to make sure that those cracks are being um, considered. I think that um, that's a, a really important principle uh, for us um, that, we, that we focus on. Uh, and the second principle that I wanna speak about is actually our first principle. Uh, and that is that we recognize that our learning gaps around Indigenous history, culture, and perspectives are largely a result of a system that marginalized or ignored Indigenous people. And that systemic changes are urgent and necessary to make sure that this does not continue. That is foundational. So when I say that we need to hold that mirror to ourselves, that also means to identify our own learning gaps. Because when we listen to the videos or to the little segments in that video, they are speaking their truth, their lived experience, or sharing the experience of some of our students. Um, and you hear that only when you are ready and in a place to take that. Um, that voice and carry it so that you can transform it into something different, a different action, a different response, um, whatever that may be. So those are two principles that I think are, are incredibly, incredibly important um, and foundational to the work that we're doing here at KPM. Thanks so much, um, Rita. Um, let me build on what what, what you've said already, and maybe I would say starting with the need to build really deep uh, relationships. Everything starts from the place of relationship. Um, and for us to be able to do that and um, in a way that allows us to recognize that schooling was created with the intent of indigenous erasure and you know to support the genocide of indigenous people um and so that there's a lot of trauma and harm there and that as much as as that might not have been created you know by me i think one of the things that i think about even as someone who shares indigenous ancestry is that i'm a part of the colonial structure by the nature of the role that i hold and so um a lot of this we have to look at both intent and impact but when we build relationships uh, we are able to sit with one another and try to work through it and sometimes hear difficult truths um, that we need to hear in order for us to do better and and you know really keeping in mind how do we center students you know um, how do we center their voices how do we center their needs um, and, and, and I think that if we're committed to that, then it makes even some of the harder conversations easier because the goal is the same. 
I think about how we build stronger relationships with elders, with wisdom keepers, with the friendship centers, with community members, so that we can keep trying to go deeper and, and, and do better in what we're doing. Um, you know, which is another really um, significant piece that we we have to keep getting better at, you know, um, so that, um, you know, um, it becomes easier for families and children to want to self-identify because they know it's safe. That it's not, um, you know, they know that when they show up that, you know, who they are matters, that the connection to the land matters, that, you know, from indigenous ways of knowing that it's the teacher is a facilitator, the land is a teacher, right? And how do we reconceptualize learning um, in ways that allows the land to be a teacher and allows, um, you know, support and facilitate children, you know, um, regaining their language, like, you know, I, I, I've personally learned like two or three words in, in the last year and they're pretty common ones, um, you know, um, but as I sat and listened to some others speak, um, I remember how, you know, both excited and sad it made me feel because that was something that was lost to us, you know. Um, so what does that look like? The other thing that I, I maybe want to just highlight is that, you know, um, because this also requires that partnership, is that as districts start to do it, and I, I know it because um, we're experiencing it in, in Waterloo, um, there are going to be people who aren't happy about this. There are going to be people who are going to be angry that we're doing it. I mean, one of the ways that we, um, we um, there was some backlash to us was because in our um, strat plan, we talk about an explicit commitment to pathways that would support indigenous sovereignty. Um, and it became quite a bit of a, um, a thing on social media uh, by people who were very angry. And, and so, you know, the, the framing around it was, this is not about education. This is an agenda. This is politics. Like kids just need to learn math and English. Um, and my response was that if children are not safe, they will never learn and that this is work that we need to do. And I think that that's where those relationships that we build, where we will need each other to be able to keep making sure that the work doesn't get stopped because some people who may not be supportive of it or who may be angered by the fact that um, it is happening, that we it doesn't get lost. Because you know the thing that I keep thinking about is that we can't lose another generation of children. We've lost so many um, because education was intentionally designed for those kids to be lost. Um, and as there are now um, uh, some of us who are trying to, to change that, there will be backlash against it because it's going against everything that the ways that it used to be, you know? And I think that, um, you know, part of what I had to do and, you know, I, I just uh, came out of like being in ceremony uh, for seven days that it's really been important for me to help ground me um, because of how hard that backlash is sometimes, um, recognizing even for students what they need and how do we help indigenous students connect back to the land and to have the things that would nurture their spirit and their well-being and help their families know that they're being taken care of in ways that are nurturing and supportive and that value them for who they are and what they and what they bring. So I think those are all things that um, you know they're you know not necessarily articulated as principle one, two, three, four, five. But those are things that I um, I continue to think about as we um, as we work through this, and I, I want to say thank you um, um, to Wendy, to Greg, to Joey Lynn, to Jennifer for um, you know sharing the 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 pieces that they shared, um, and for giving us the opportunity to think um, together and to think out loud in ways that we can really support um, Indigenous students and families and to support the work of truth and reconciliation.